And that's why this past week, as I was reading Reader's Digest, remember now I'm over 30, I found an article in there that I thought uh, was right on target. It's by a man that I think we're well familiar with. His name is Alexander Solnitsyn, the Russian dissident, the 1970 winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. I want to simply read some excerpts of this little essay simply entitled, Men Have Forgotten God. When I started going to school, in the Rastodon, other children egged on by the commissar members taunted me for accompanying my mother to the last remaining church in town and tore the cross from around my neck. A few years later, I heard a number of older people offer this explanation for the great disasters that have befallen Russia. Men have forgotten God. That's why all this has happened. Since then, I have spent well nigh 50 years working on the history of the Russian Revolution and collected hundreds of personal testimonies, read hundreds of books, and contributed eight volumes of my own. But if I were asked today to formulate as concise as possible the main cause of the ruinous revolution that swallowed up some 60 million of our people, I could not put it more accurately than to repeat. Men have forgotten God. You know, we read in the newspaper this past week tragedies that certainly echo these words. In Pakistan, terrorists hijacked, a in confusion, killed 18 wounded scores of others. Today, front page, Istanbul, 24 people killed in a synagogue while they are worshiping God. Let me tell you something. It's clear that the world, both East and West, have forgotten God. We say, well, what do you mean about the West? Solnitsyn goes on. The West has yet to experience a communist invasion. Religion remains free. But the West, too, is experiencing a drying up of religious consciousness. Since the late Middle Ages, the tide of secularism has progressively inundated the West. This gradual sapping of strength from within is a threat to faith that is perhaps even more dangerous than any attempt to assault religion violently from without. The meaning of life in the West has ceased to be seen as anything more lofty than, quote, the pursuit of happiness, a goal that has even been solemnly guaranteed by constitutions. The concepts of good and evil have long been banished from common use. It has become embarrassing to appeal to eternal concepts, embarrassing to state that evil makes it home in the individual human heart before it enters a political system. All attempts to find a way out of the plight of today's world are fruitless unless we redirect our consciousness in repentance to the Creator of all. The resources we have set aside for ourselves are too impoverished for the task. We must first recognize the horror perpetrated not by some outside force, not by class or national enemies, but within each of us individually and within every society. Life consists not in the pursuit of material success, but in the quest for worthy spiritual growth. Our entire earthly existence is but a transitional stage in the movement to something higher. Amen? Material laws alone do not explain our life or give its direction. 
The laws of physics and physiology will never reveal the indisputable manner in which the Creator constantly participates in the life of each of us. And in the life of our entire planet, the Divine Spirit surely moves with no less force. To the ill-considered hopes of the last two centuries, we can propose only a determined quest for the warm hand of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, today we've been reminded by the words of a man who has seen the torment of violence and anger and of sin from within the heart of man. Today, Father, we see a man who has come to know also our Western society and sees the emptiness that pervades it in our pursuit of happiness. Heavenly Father, let us be redirected to you this morning. Father, not let us be like the Israelites who after experiencing the great coming out of Egypt, seeing the wonders of your mighty hand fold back the Red Sea and cause them to be drawn safely to the other side while destroying the most powerful army on earth just three days later, grumbled and complained, let us not be like these that have gone before us. But Heavenly Father, help us to remember you always and to experience the warmth of your guiding hand. We love you, Heavenly Father. Be with us during this lesson and change our hearts. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It is clear that the world has forgotten God, both East and West. But good news, God has not forgotten man. Let's turn to John chapter 10. Verse 7, Therefore Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus Christ has come that we may have life and have it to the full. Jesus Christ has come that we might have abundant life. Amen? Amen. He goes on, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up. This command I receive from my Father. It is clear that God has not forgotten man. It is clear from this passage that God desires every single person to have an abundant life. He wants us, quote unquote, to be happy, to be at peace, to experience life at its fullest. But it does not come, according to the scriptures, when we pursue happiness in and of itself. It only comes when we pursue the Good Shepherd. Amen? So many people are baffled by that. And we've got to be convinced as Christians 
that Jesus is truly the Good Shepherd. The robbers and the thieves of the wolves that are out to get us in the wo world. And so often people don't even trust religion, they don't even trust God because in the, in the world they've been so taken advantage of. Let me tell you something, the church of Jesus Christ is different. There are three things from this passage that we need to be reminded of. First of all, Jesus is the Good Shepherd. How do we know that He loves us? Very simply this, that He laid down His life for the sheep. What greater demonstration can there be of love than to give up one's life? Secondly, we find that the true sheep are the ones that hear His voice. The true sheep are the ones that hear His voice. What is the voice of Jesus? It is the Word of God. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, my children have really gotten into one of the new songs in Sunday school. And one of the new songs in Sunday school, I sort of like it too. We sing it a lot at Family Devotional. It's called, I Just Want to Be a Sheep Bath. It's pretty complicated, but I've got it down right about now. And the next, next verse is pretty catchy too. He says, I don't want to be a Pharisee because they're not fair, you see. And then the next one is, I don't want to be a Sadducee because they're so sad, you see. But my favorite one is, I don't want to be a goat, nope. Goats don't go to heaven. Nope. I just want to be a sheep. Bah. <laughs> it was pretty interesting. The other day at the uh, grocery store, Elena was there with Sean, and Sean is very, uh, he, well, let's put it this way, he's not real quiet. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he's going, Mommy, Mommy, is that person a sheep or a goat? <laughs> he's got the big picture, you might say. But how do you know if you are a sheep? I mean, you may be here maybe for the first time. And the question has to come into your mind. Well, Jesus says, I'm either a sheep or a goat. So the question comes, what is the difference? The sheep listen to the voice of the Good Shepherd. The sheep hear the Word of God. That's the test of knowing if you're a sheep. See, sometimes people can even slip into the congregation and certainly be wolves. Those are the people that take people after them. But I think there may be a few goats. What, are, what is a goat attitude? That even sounds bad, doesn't it? You don't want to have a goat attitude. A goat attitude is that attitude which doesn't listen to the Word of God. I'll take it further. A goat attitude is one that doesn't listen to the Word of God even spoken by a brother or a sister. That's a goat attitude. And goats don't go to heaven. Nope. I just want to be a sheep. Bah. The other encouraging thing from this passage in John 10 is to know that Jesus always intended for there to simply be but one flock. Isn't that interesting? Even as he spoke, he always intended there but to be one flock, one shepherd, one flock. And you know, I believe that we have got to have stronger teaching on this passage of Scripture, that there is but one church universal. And the true church is, is, is very simply defined. It's all those people, no matter what country they live in, USA, Russia, uh, India, Africa, no matter where they live, it's the one church universal where all those people who listen to the Word of God and obey it precisely, not almost. There's no such thing as being almost saved. You're either saved or you're not. And so the church universal, the one church, 
is simply defined as all those people who hear the voice of God in the Scriptures. And we've got to start talking about the one church again and not being so nervous about talking about it. Listen, it's good news if Jesus spoke about it. And it's really rather sickening, to me at least, and I'm supposed to the Lord, to even contemplate that, well, people get to choose what kind of church they want to go to, one that expects a large commitment or one that expects a small. Jesus is not asking for his people to search for a comfortable pew. He wants them all to obey the word of God. That's what defines a sheep. But you know, without question, Jesus has come to be a good shepherd. Not sort of like that. Good shepherd. Not just a shepherd, but we're talking good shepherd. He's out for our best interests. But you know something? Jesus not only is out for our best interests, and that's very comforting, isn't it, to think that he's the shepherd over us? But he calls us to be out for other people's best interests. Turn to John, chapter 21. It's interesting that this passage is in the same book that the passage about the sheep and the shepherd is in. In chapter 20, we find the record of Jesus' physical resurrection from the dead. In chapter 21, we read about the fact that Peter and all the rest of the apostles had gone back to fishing. And one day, Jesus is standing on the bank, and he appears to him this the third time after the resurrection, and once again, the disciples are out there fishing, and they haven't caught anything. You'd think they'd get the message by now that fishing wasn't their thing, right? But the Lord from the bank, and he was so far out from where they were at, he said, listen, put down your, your nets on the right side of the boat. Well, they'll take advice, you know, when nothing is worrying, you'll take advice from anybody. So they put it down, and sure enough, a whole bunch of fish come into it. I mean, it's just weighing down the nets, and then they recognize. John said, it's the Lord. I mean, who else would it be? And so Peter gets so excited about the Lord, he ties his outer clothing around his waist, jumps in the water, you know, swimming towards the Lord, you know. The rest of the guys are bringing in this big haul of fish. The Bible says there were 153 fish. Pretty awesome, huh? And they're just so excited to see the Lord. And the Lord's got some breakfast going for him. And then the record of the Scripture reads in verse 15. When they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Probably talking about the fish and the boats and the nets. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. You know, I don't think this is an accidental recording by John. I think it's very purposeful. I think it's meant to be connected to John chapter 10. What's Jesus trying to do right here, very simply? It's this. The disciples are still dabbling in the world and worldly pursuits to find happiness. Jesus, listen. Peter, come here. Peter, do you love me? And the word right there in the Greek is agape. It means a total self-sacrificing love. He says, Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me more than these things? And Peter answers back. It doesn't come out in English. He answers back. He says, yes, Lord, I phileo you. That's another word for love in the Greek. It means, yes, I'm your friend. He says, well, yes, Lord, you know I'm your friend. And he says, listen, well, feed my lambs. Second time, Jesus says, listen, Peter, do you agape me? Are you willing to lay your life down? And second time, he answers back. He says, yes, Lord, I phileo you. I, I want to be your friend. I want to be your buddy. Third time, Jesus says, listen, do you even phileo me? Are you really even my friend? 
And Peter says, the Bible simply says he was very hurt because a third time he said, are you even my friend? And he says, well, Lord, you know everything. And Jesus says, then feed my sheep. Let me tell you something. After the seminar, I think that it's time for all of us to come down here to John chapter 21. At the seminar, all of us were called to make a total commitment to Jesus Christ. And yet, what have we done this week? Have we radically changed our lives in the area of prayer? Have we radically denounced worldly possessions? Or have we gotten about our business just about the same as it was before as after? I can't help but feel that Jesus at this hour would want to sort of pull us aside and say, hey, I want to talk to you. Do you truly love me more than your job, your house, your home? How about it? Even your family? I mean, that's the charge, isn't it? And we say, well, well Lord, you, you know I'm your friend. I mean, I was there the whole seminar. He says, no, feed my lambs. Jesus says, well, now listen. Do you really want to agape me? Really love me? Give your whole life to me. He said, well, Lord, you know, I'm one of your best buddies in the whole congregation. I mean, I sing the loudest. I shared my faith a couple times last week. And I did read my Bible every day. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a buddy. I'm, I'm a friend. He said, well, listen, feed my sheep third time he comes up to us and says listen are you really even my friend how would we be feeling pretty hurt right you know why Peter was feeling extra hurt because just a few days earlier three times he had denied the Lord and right here the Lord stamps indelibly upon his mind the fact that he can not only just have this idea of being a friend with Jesus, but he must give his whole life to Jesus. That is the call of Jesus Christ. And the charge is the same. Go feed my sheep. You know, it's very interesting to me about the, our theme text for our seminar. Let's go back and look at it, Matthew 9. In verse 35, the Bible simply says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and helping and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. When Jesus saw people, he saw people that were harassed and that were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. This was one of the things that caused him to turn to the brothers and say, listen, we need to pray because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. This was one of the motivating things was the compassion that he saw and felt for the people that were around him. Truly, what could be said about Jesus was very simply this. He loved the unlovable. Get that down. He loved the unlovable. Let's look at some, some occasions in which the disciples got to see Jesus loved the unlovable. Let's turn to Luke chapter 19. Verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead, climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, 
He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay it back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation's come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man did, came to seek and to save what was lost. You know, right here we find that Jesus is entering the town of Jericho. By this time, he's very, very, very well-known. I mean, he's, he's so well-known throughout the whole nation of Israel. And so people from near and far just wanted to, to catch a glimpse of the Lord. And you can just imagine all the people wanting to line up to be able to see the Lord on the streets and coming into the town of Jericho. And even Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, that scoundrel, the chief tax collector wanted to get a view of Jesus. And so being a short man, now you know how short people feel about themselves. Pretty unloved, right? Okay. Being a short man, and you sort of picture him now, and also being chief tax collector, I mean, probably wore some, some pretty nice, pretty nice clothes. You know, a nice, nice looking suit. But also being chief tax collector, he's probably a little bit older. You can imagine the old balding head, can't you? A little bit of bulging stomach, right? So here he is. He's super anxious to see the Lord. And he's got this nice suit on. You know, he looks like probably a typical chief tax collector. You know how they look. And he couldn't see anything. I mean, all the crowd was so in front of him, he couldn't see anything. The Lord was coming. He says, oh, what am I going to do? Oh, there's a tree. Should I climb it? Yeah, absolutely. So he climbs it, you know, and you sort of see this man sort of waddle up the tree, you know, and sort of pounce up there in the branches. And he says, ah, hot dog. Got a good, good, good view right here, you know. And he's up there, and the Lord's coming on through. Everybody's cheering. Everybody is just shouting, Hosanna, the Lord's here. I mean, it's a powerful moment. And then all of a sudden, the Lord stops just a few feet from the, the fig tree, and he says, Zacchaeus. What are you doing up there? He says, listen, Zacchaeus, I'd like to stay at your house today. Blew his mind. <laughs> On the spot, the Bible says, people began to mutter, he's going to be a guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus was so moved by the Lord's attention and his love and his compassion that he simply stands up and he says, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. That's pretty awesome, right? And if I cheat anybody out of anything, well, now, what do you think about that? Do you think there's a possibility of that? I will pay it back four times the amount. So there goes the other half. So the Lord says, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. That was the mission of Jesus to seek and to save what is lost. But how did... Not just all the likable people, but Jesus loved even Zacchaeus, that fat, stubby, bald-headed guy who cheated people out of so many things. Jesus loved him. Amen? Go to Mark chapter 1. Once more, the disciples are with Jesus. And we read in verse 40 these words. A man with leprosy came to Jesus and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing. Be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news.
cared enough to touch this guy. Just enough to touch him, to hold him. You know, there are times when words just won't even do. Even the Lord couldn't say words yet. He needed to touch him. That was the thing that said, I loved you. Instead of being repulsed by what he saw, Jesus was drawn. He was filled with compassion. And the Bible says he touched the man. He says, listen, I'm willing to cleanse you. Immediately, the leprosy left him. Talk about awesome. That would have been awesome. I mean, that's better than almost $2 million in the contribution. I mean, we've done that Saturday night. The whole place would have broken loose, right? But you know something? So often, we are repulsed by the world now that we're good Christians. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 9, Paul writes to the church at Corinth. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. You know, uh, let's just lay it out this morning. There isn't a righteous person numbered amongst us. There isn't one person that can say, I have stayed righteous all of my life, and therefore I deserve to go to heaven. And even our righteousness, according to Isaiah, are simply but filthy rags to the Lord. And yet sometimes we get a very uppity attitude towards people in the world. God forbid it. We got to remember the book clearly that the immoral people, people who have sex before marriage, the idolaters, people who put things before God or jobs before God, the adulterers, those people who commit immorality while they have a marriage commitment. Or prostitutes, those who lie with one of a like sex. Homosexual offenders or thieves or the greedy, the drunkards, the slanders, the swindlers. Listen, these people will not inherit the kingdom of God and there's no but if right there. I always like this little line Paul tossed on in. But that's what some of you guys were. But then I like the next line the best. But you were washed. Amen? Amen. You, were, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. He reminded them from whence they came. And brothers and sisters, I think it's time we got reminded about our past. Because let me tell you something. There are a lot more people out there like us and we should not draw back at the people who are in sin in the world. But we should be filled with compassion and say, hey, I know they're empty because I committed those same sins. And it's time to be that way with Jesus. And you know something? When you have been freed of sins like this, you're going to be just like that man with leprosy. You are going to be so fired up. You're going to go tell people everywhere about the good news. Even if Jesus told you to be quiet, you couldn't be quiet. It's such excellent news. Amen? And you know, you got to admit, if you're a true Christian in here, you will never forget the day of your baptism. You'll never forget the day of your baptism. You know, it's very interesting. I had a couple people raised in the church, 
And uh, I appreciate particularly Rush Yule and working with some of the people that have been raised in church. In other words, they, they, they were born into a family that were members of the Church of Christ. And, uh, you know, these people made a decision very early on. But it wasn't a true whole hard decision. They couldn't remember all the reasons they did it. You know, something's wrong there, don't you think? And so I'm thankful that he was able to study with them and to be brought to a true decision for Jesus Christ. And yes, they were, quote-unquote, immersed when they were really young, but you're only baptized once. And you know something? I think for all the rest of us, let's not forget not only the baptism, but what got washed away in that baptistry. They were all pretty murky when we got out. And here's the point. Let's not be drawn away from the people with sin. Let's get away from the sins. Amen. But let's be filled with compassion. Let's reach out to people. Amen. Let's go to Mark chapter 10. You may say, well, that's, uh, Kip, I appreciate those points. Uh, you know, but I, I never committed adultery before and uh, haven't really been into homosexuality lately and I don't believe that my three-car garage is true greed. I mean, after all, it's attitude, isn't it? So I really can't relate to that kind of a situation. Well, okay. Let's look at another man. We find in Mark chapter 10, this young man very interested in spiritual things. Matter of fact, he asked the Lord, how can I have eternal life? That's a bottom line question. And Jesus gives him a straightforward answer. Verse 19, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. He says, teacher, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Okay, now we got a guy just like you now. A good guy. It's really excellent when we find someone in the scriptures like us, isn't it? Now look at how the Lord felt about this person. Verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. That's awesome. He, I mean, the, Jesus only met this guy for about 10, 15 seconds, and he's filled with compassion, and he, and, he, and he loves him. We stand in the grocery line with the people in front of us, and we get a bad attitude because they don't move along faster. Listen, the Lord has given you more chance to talk to this person. The Bible says Jesus looked at him and loved him. He says, one thing you lack... Go sell everything you have, give the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. You know, it's very interesting to me right here. Jesus was a friend to this man like nobody had been a friend to him before. So now hold a kid. This guy gets mad and upset and sad after he leaves Jesus. That's because Jesus spoke the truth in love. He told him not what he wanted to hear, but what he needed to hear. We get upset at pulpits that lay it out because we feel guilty. Let me tell you something. If you're in sin and you feel guilty, then rightly so. That's the Holy Spirit that's convicting you of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. We get upset with Christians that lay it out. Whether we're a Christian or a non-Christian, they just lay it out. Say, listen, I think you're doing something wrong right here. We get a bad attitude. We get a bad attitude. Why? Because we're being told we're wrong. I mean, we were not trained to say, you're wrong. Hey, thanks. I appreciate that. I enjoy being wrong. <laughs> Bro, thank you so much for pointing out that sin. I, I've, wanted, I've been looking for someone all day just to do that. But you know something? Right here, the Bible says Jesus was just instantly filled with love. And you know something? He demonstrated it by speaking the truth in love. Let me ask you, though, this. If Jesus came to you today and said, listen, there's one thing keeping you outside the kingdom, what would it be? Is it riches like the rich young man? Possessions? Is it a relationship? Is it a job? Is it simply an attitude? Is it a goal in your life? 
My friend, get rid of it and come into the kingdom. Our brother and sister, are you the kind of person that's rebellious when people confront you with sin and what you've done wrong? Let me tell you something. You'll have no better friend than the friend that sits down with you and says, Brother, you're in sin. Or, Brother, you've made a mistake here. I think that if we need something in the church at this hour, it's straightforward communication in love. Truth naked hurts. You're right. But truth with love can heal. Amen? And I think that one thing is we're so culturized in America to be nice to everybody that really our niceness is a false love. True love is like Jesus that speaks the truth in love and communicates straightforwardly what's bothering them, what's wrong, what the sin is, what the mistake is, and lays it out. I really believe we need to learn to speak the truth in love. You know, it was really great. We had some brothers from London here, great brothers, and uh, they were very complimentary to the congregation. They said, we have never seen a congregation that has so much love in it. That's a great compliment. I mean, truly, the ultimate thing that Christians were to be known for was what? Their love one for another. Amen? But simply being warm and vibrant in our singing and giving to each other is not enough love. We've got to be like Jesus and lay it out what the sins are, what the problems are, even at the cost of the relationship. Do you love that person more than you love the relationship with them? Prayerfully, you love that person and their soul more than a relationship with them. Let's look at our last one. In Luke 7. In verse 11. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Right here, we find a very tense moment. The Lord, with his disciples and a large group following after him, intersects with a large funeral procession. And it's a very sad one. Because the person who's in the casket is the son, the only son of a widow. In other words, her husband is dead, and this is her only son that's died, and usually sons were the ones that provided for the welfare of the rest of the family when the father died, and so she's in a desperate strait. Not only missing the human being that she loved the most on earth, her husband, but now her beloved son died. Was it by illness? Was it an accident? The scriptures are silent. But we know that he was dead. And the Bible says right here that a large crowd was with her, but all they could do was cry. Jesus sees her. The Bible simply says his heart went out to her. I mean, it just went out to her. He says, I've got to help this woman. He stops the whole funeral procession stops his whole crowd. Now, he doesn't say this, but he says, listen, i got something to say here. He just says to that woman, don't cry. Now, 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 wouldn't you like to say that to people? Those that have been ripped up by divorces, those that have been ripped up in other relationships, those that have even had death in their family, wouldn't you just like to be able to say, don't cry. That's not that Jesus was hard. As a matter of fact, I mean, he cried over the lost city of Jerusalem. It's not that Jesus was hard even over personal people. I mean, he cried even over the death of Lazarus. That's not the point. We do need tears in relationships, amen? But the, the point of his words, don't cry right here, is that Jesus had an answer for death. 
so there was no need to cry. What was Jesus' answer for death? Resurrection. Works every time. And so the Bible simply says right here, he goes up, touches the coffin, and he says, young man, I say, you get up. It's a good thing he didn't stay laying down right there. Lord would have had other words for him. And the Bible says the dead man sat up and began to talk. Talk about blowing the place away. And Jesus gave him back to his mom. Then everybody, they're, they're, they're all filled with awe and they praise God. A great prophets appeared among us. And he says, God has come to help his people. That is our God. God has come to help his people. Let's not forget him. And news of this spread throughout the whole countryside. Luke 15. Verse 3. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. The story is told of a shepherd who has a hundred sheep whose one sheep has gone out and gotten lost. He leaves the 99 and he searches, and in my mind, searches day and night until he finds, in my mind, sort of a little lamb. There's a famous painting on it, actually. I sort of picture it that way, too. It's the shepherd reaching over a cliff to grab this little lamb who's fallen off the edge of the cliff, has been caught by the briars, but is just about ready to fall into a bottomless pit. That's sort of how I picture it. He comes and grabs that little lamb just before it goes on over and grabs it. And then you know what he does? He smiles with tears, puts that little lamb around his shoulders, and says, we're going home. We're going home. We're going to see all the other sheep. It's going to be awesome. And we're going, to, we're going to have a great party. We're not going to serve lamb chops, but we're going to have a great party. <laughs> have you ever lost something of value? I remember a few years ago now, when I was in fifth grade, I lived in Whalen back in those days. My dad worked in the Navy down here at the shipyard. And uh, we were about ready to move out to Chicago. And I had this one cat, this big black cat since I was five years old. His name was Jinx. I didn't name him because he was black, Jinx. I named him after Pixie and Dixie Jinx on the, you know, you remember, the cartoons. <laughs> but I loved old Jinx. I mean, he just, you know, he got a little bit older, but he got a lot more tame. He used to come and just sort of cuddle down my pillow. I'd have to shove him off my pillow when I came to bed. He'd look at me as if something strange was happening. I let him know that the pillow was half mine. But, you know, I loved Jinx. And I suppose because of all the moving and all the different things that were happening, Jinx was sort of upset. And so the day that we were moving... He didn't come home. And, you know, I pleaded my dad, let's not go to the hotel until we find Jinx. His dad says, no, we're all tired. We're going to the hotel, and then we're going to leave. I said, no, Dad, we can't leave Jinx. So finally, the next morning, I just put up a fit like you've never seen a fit. <laughs> I'm not even going to tell my kids about it. I wouldn't want even to know about something like that ever existed. And I was able to pervade on my father. And we went back to the house, and we called, and we called, and just as we were about to leave and get into the car, there came Jinx. 
I mean, tell you, I just cried and I cried at seeing Jinx. And he's a stupid old cat. <laughs> but you know something? How about it? Do we cry and cry at the lost souls that are around us? How about the people that aren't Christians in your family? Does that rip you up? Grandparents, parents, sons, and daughters, you ought to be ripped up. How about your neighbors? Do you even know them all? We are coming up this month with what I think is going to be one of the most exciting weeks ever in this congregation. We're going to have many campaigns. And this is not something you should be afraid of. It should be something that you are looking forward to with longing anticipation. To be able to go out and share with your friends and your neighbors about the church, about the great things that are happening in your neighborhood Bible study, and about the, the, the gatherings that are going to be happening all over Boston with some great preaching from the Word by the Zone Evangelists. It's going to be an awesome week. We need, though, to be asking people, not just, not, not just for that campaign then, but we need to be asking people every day because they're lost. To come to our Bible talks, to come to services. The campuses are just starting. The high schools are just beginning. Now is the time before all the relationships are bonded. Get them interested in the Lord before they get distracted. And let us proclaim the greatest news that ever was that life can be lived to the full, not in the pursuit of happiness, but in the pursuit of God. You know, I couldn't help but think, this past Thursday we got invited out by some friends uh, to go hear this concert by Julio Iglesias. You know, Elena has a Spanish background, so that was, you know, interesting. And uh, we went... And I, I suppose they had about 5,000 people there, about, about the same number we had at the seminar. And, you know, the thing that hit me was the emptiness of the people that were there. And even in some of the songs, I mean, three-quarters of the songs were in Spanish, and I was out of it. But a few of them were in English, and one of the most sickening ones was this one he'd done with Willie Nelson about, you know, of all the girls I've ever loved before. You talk about the emptiness that's there. And people were clapping and everything. But you know, even in the enthusiasm of that hour, it did not match the enthusiasm of the hours that we spent at the seminar. And I said, praise God. Finally, God's people were doing something more exciting, even to them, than that was in the world. And let me tell you something, it's a lot more exciting talking about Jesus than Julio. And he's got a good voice, but he's got a wrong message. And I really believe that the challenge before us is simple. Do not forget God. Love God. Love one another. And love the lost. And then truly, we can feed the sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you need to respond this morning, 
because you're not a Christian and you want to have the Lord as the good shepherd because you as a sheep have heard his voice, come forward. Men in the aisles will have cards. If you as a Christian from the seminar or from the conviction of this sermon feel that you have not been the kind of person you need to be, that you've gone back to the boats and the nets and the fishes instead of feeding the sheep, then come forward. But as a congregation, let us never, never, never forget that the Lord is our shepherd and we shall lack nothing.